I want to introduce this series this morning. Doug just mentioned we're starting a new series. It's called Passionate Faith, and it's a series that uh, we'll start this morning. We won't use it next week at the Gallagher, but it's going to go four weeks, three weeks after we have the gathering there. And I want to take you to the words of Jesus. Uh, the theme verse for this series is found in John chapter 10. It's actually verse 10. I want to start with verse 9. Jesus said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. You ever seen just cattle out in a green pasture grazing with great peace and they have enough and they... Jesus uses this analogy of pasturing and shepherding often. He says, I am the gate into the pasture. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out, find pasture. There will be a, a peace, a rest for them. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come, Jesus said, I have come for us that they, it's us, may have life and may have it to the full. That's a life in Christ that we now apprehend by faith. And we want to encourage each other in this faith so we can live this full and meaningful life that he wanted to give to us by coming. A little later in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, Jesus spoke and John wrote down what he was revealing to him. And Jesus went and he was addressing different church gatherings, different churches in different cities. And what he would do is he would go there and he would encourage them with what Jesus knew about what was going on for them spiritually, and then he would correct them in ways that they needed correction spiritually. In Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 14, we read something that he said to the church in Laodicea. And so he wrote this to the church in Laodicea. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the ruler of God's creation, Jesus. I know your deeds, he said, that you are neither cold or hot. I wish you were either one or the other. Because you are lukewarm, he said. You ever had, like, go get a glass of milk and it's lukewarm? Maybe it's been sitting out for a while and maybe it's curdled a little. You drink that and what's the first thing you want to do? Spit it out. Find a sink, right? And spit it out. Jesus is talking about the people in this church, and he said, you know, your faith, your faith isn't what it should be. It's not cold. I don't mind if it's cold. It's not hot. It's not passionate. It's not strong. It's kind of in the middle. It's lukewarm. It's like you're playing with your faith in me. He said, I wish it was one or the other, one of the extremes, because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. It it was like curdled milk. It wasn't palatable to him. So we have this series this morning called Passionate Faith. And it's really right in line with not just what Jesus wants for people to have a strong faith, but it's really a part of our mission as a church, as I said. And we have these four strategic themes. And just introducing the series here, we're going to do four series this year. And each one of them is going to be on one of these themes. And when people come through our new members class, one of the first things we do is we say, here's what we want for you as a part of Orchard Hill. We want you to have a strong faith for your faith to be nurtured. We want you to be intentional with your family in whatever way your family is organized so that your family might become more and more impacting in the world. It's for healthy and strong family that affects the world. We want you to find some close spiritual friends who will encourage your faith and help you grow. And then we want you to see how God has called you to serve in the kingdom. Just what Doug was talking about in the journey and finding out what does God want for me. So those are the four themes. We're going to have a series based on each one this year. This next four weeks is on the first one, having a passionate and strong faith. Jesus said he would like us to have a strong faith or a cold faith. And so that's what this morning and the next few weeks is about. I want to ask you this morning about your faith before we even get into the series. How do you feel about your faith? Hot, cold, lukewarm? Really, honestly, I know sometimes faith goes up and down every day. If you're evaluating yourself spiritually, I've talked with people in our church family who feel like they're, they don't, they're very cold, no faith. Some who feel strong, many of us oscillate at different times. 
One of my favorite stories about faith is about a young man, new pilot, flying south in the Minnesota area, flew south, uh, took off, took about 11, 12 miles south, and something went wrong with the plane, and he went down, and he knew he flew over a, a lake on his way, and, and he went down in there, didn't get killed, so he, he had to make his way back to the city where he took off from. And as he went back across, he knew he was going to have to cross that pond. It was in you know, early stages of winter. He didn't know how frozen the pond was. And so he decided easier for him to cross the pond. He would make it before nightfall to get back to the city. So what he did was he spread his weight out on the ice to try and crawl across the pond to get home. He didn't know how thick the ice was. His confidence in the ice wasn't very thick at all. He had what you'd say maybe a weak faith, cold faith. So he starts crawling out there, and of course, the ice, when you put pressure on it, buckles and pops, and so then he's even more nervous. He gets out to the center of the lake on all fours, spreading his weight out, and all of a sudden he hears a rumble. And he looks down the road and down, down the pond, and there was a road coming on to the pond, and there was a farmer with an eight-horse hitch hauling a wag of corn across the pond. The faith that this man had wasn't really about the ice. It was about what was going on inside of him. All of a sudden he knew there was no chance he was going to fall through this ice. It held eight horses and a wagon of corn. And so what did he do? He got up, brushed himself off, and walked across the pond and headed to the town. All because his faith changed. Jesus said, I wish your faith was either cold or hot. I have a graph on the screen here. Simply before we get into this series, I want you to ask yourself, am I a zero? One? Two? Is my faith cold? Is my faith hot? Is it strong? Am I a ten? Or am I in that middle range that Jesus is talking about? And I hope in this series, our hope in this series is that you would increase your faith. You would be like that guy on the ice that would stand up and move with a little more confidence because of your faith in God in life. That's really the hope of this series. It's going to be the four weeks. Ed's going to talk about our need to nourish our souls, our emotions, and our our mental state to have a strong faith. Alice is going to talk about needing to live with gratitude in our lives and thankfulness to God to have a strong faith. Dave's going to talk about how it's more of a marathon than a sprint. We need to view it that way. And I want to talk today about priorities and how our priorities in life that we choose correlate with our faith. So with that as an introduction to the series, I'd like to say one more prayer and focus us. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you. Give us this opportunity And I do pray that you help us hear from you, as Doug said, even through the singing, through the worship, and now as we look into your word. You came that we might have life, and that life is apprehended by faith now. So I pray that you encourage us in our faith in these next four weeks, five weeks, that we could walk more confidently in life because of our assurance in our spirits with you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Today I want to talk to you about priorities. Priorities are those things in life that we deem important, of high importance. And when we deem something of high importance, well, that means we will put more time and energy into it. It's not so much what we say that are our priorities, it's, it's how we live. It's like the lady who bought two tickets to the Super Bowl. And she had a ticket for her and her husband. And she was excited about the Super Bowl, very anxiously looking forward to it. And then when she got to the Super Bowl... It just so happened her husband wasn't with her. And so she went up there, and it was probably the only empty seat in the Super Bowl, and one of the guys beside her couldn't believe it and said, I can't believe you've got an empty seat there beside you. You know, were you going to bring somebody? Or, yeah, that was my husband. He was going to come along. And the gentleman said, "Well, well, what happened? Why is he not here? Oh, he passed away, she said. And he was a little shocked, and he said, well, Couldn't you get a ticket for another friend or another family member? I mean, didn't one of them want to come along? She said, yeah, I couldn't believe it either. They all thought going to his funeral was more important than coming to the Super Bowl. Our behavior 
really shows our priorities. Our priorities are what matter most to us. It's often said that if you look at your checkbook, you see where your money flows, you look at your calendar, you see where your time flows, then you start to know your priorities. You know in your heart and in your mind, what do I think about most? What am I most excited about? What am I most passionate about? What takes up most of my energy? That's priority. A priority is something we give of first importance. We can have several of them. I went to the Bible and I was thinking, God, would you show me again what are the most important things you want us to tend to in life? And I went to the Gospels and I started looking through the life of Jesus and I said, Jesus, show me again what is most important to your life. And as I was looking at the pages of the Gospels and I was thinking about Jesus' life and I was praying, it all of a sudden dawned on me. Jesus lived out the highest priority that God wants for all of us perfectly. He was the perfect example for us. And his life exemplifies the main priority that's written in every page of this book. This book is about a lot of things, but one thing it's about is priorities. From beginning to end, God displays his priorities in here. Man's priorities are listed in here. And oftentimes the clash between God's priorities and man's priorities are written about in this book. And when you study the life of Jesus, you see one who lived out God's priorities perfectly in this world. And you just, it can be inspiring to see the passion. We had a movie about him not long ago called The Passion because of the priority that Jesus was living out in his life. And when you study the scriptures, you find out there is one overarching priority that God wants for all of us. It's like the movie City Slickers. You know, where young men go, this movie's about young men who go to the West and try and reorient their lives. And there's an actor there, you know, he's named Curly, he's Jack Palance, and he's kind of this sage cowboy that is in the West, and as these these young guys, and one of them's Billy Crystal, come, come to the West to try and find themselves over a couple of weeks, you know, herding cattle and such. The, this Jack Palance kind of mentors them along the way. And one time, Billy Crystal's riding beside Jack. And Billy Crystal starts to tell Jack why he admires him, that he's kind of got life figured out and that his life makes sense. And Jack says, well, it's really not that hard. This is curly to Billy Crystal. It's really not that hard. He said, you know, make it so complex. He said, the secret to life, and Jack holds up a finger. And Billy's kind of looking at him, he says, it's a finger? And Curly says, no, the secret to life is one thing. Now, I couldn't play the clip because of what else he says, but he says, the secret to life is one thing. And then basically he said, everything else is just squat. And Billy's interested now. He says, well, what's the secret? And then Curly says, well, that's what you got to figure out. You know, if that's the truth, we're all in a world of hurt. I mean, if we're left to ourselves to figure out what life's all about and what really matters, I mean, just look around the world. It's chaos. And what we say is, God has given us a revelation, and we believe He's taught us, without air, what to believe and how to live. Do you think the Creator wound us up and said, now, go figure it out? He gave us an instruction manual. And he pointed us, really, to the secret of life. The Bible says the simplicity of God often escapes us. But it's it's really quite simple. It's not that easy to live out, but the Bible declares from beginning to end the main secret to life, the highest priority God wants for us. And if we get this right, he assures us our life will be full 
It will be meaningful. We will operate in the way we were wired to operate. I want to turn to the middle of the Bible and just look at these priorities as they were tested, different priorities as they were tested by a man named Solomon, King Solomon. It's the book of Ecclesiastes. And he did this work. My mom often said to me, Tim, you can learn things the hard way or you can learn from others. And I've always said, okay, mom, I'd like to learn for other, from others. Just, you know, Lord, help me have a teachable spirit. Solomon tried it all. Different priorities. He said, I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I devoted myself to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under heaven. So he went after discovering everything. He tried five major priorities that are promoted in our world. I just want you to look at him for a minute. The first one is pleasure. Listen to what he said. I thought in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure and find out what is good. Pleasure is good. God made us to experience pleasure. But pleasure as a priority is found wanting. Listen to what Solomon did. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings of provinces. I acquired men and women singers and a harem as well. The delights of the heart of man were mine. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all of this pleasure seeking, he says, I denied myself nothing. My eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. And in the end, I found it, his word is, meaningless. Meaningless. Pleasure as a priority was found lacking. He tried meaningful work. Maybe if I put my hands to productive and meaningful work, what does he say of it? For a man may do his work with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then he must leave all he owns to someone who has not worked for it. This, too, is found wanting as a priority. God gave us the ability to work, but it's a bad priority in life. Then he tried advancement. And he considered maybe meaning in life is found from, and he observed how the poor could become wiser and make some money and become rich and, and establish some sort of position and get a title. And he said, all of this just goes. There was no end to all the people who were before them. Those who came later were not pleased with their successor. This too, advancement, is like a chasing after the wind. Three major themes that are promoted to us consistently in life for priorities. Pleasure. Pleasure. Work, advancement, all found wanting as priorities. So he tried riches, riches, and he was richer than probably anyone before him and maybe richer than anyone who's ever been. And he said, whoever loves money will never have money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless, he said. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owner except to feast his eyes on them? And then he tried wisdom. And wisdom, the pursuit of knowledge and understanding of life and these five themes, wisdom, he said, now wisdom is better than foolishness. It's better than folly. But wisdom was found wanting. And then in the end of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, who tried these five major priorities, came to an understanding of what the Bible says from beginning to end that there's one priority in life. And he said it this way, Now all has been heard, and here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Jesus lived out in perfect obedience, a reverence for his Father, an obedience to his Father, an intimacy with his Father, so that Jesus had, as the highest priority of his life, he said, to do the will of him who sent him. Last year we did a series called Whatever It Takes. 
and we had a pie graph that we put up, and we talked about how we're often encouraged to think about our lives in terms of different categories or sections of life that we want to give energy to, and, and one part of those categories, you know, our job, our daily responsibilities, recreation, and one piece of the pie would be God. We talked about how this is an erroneous way to look at life when you read through the pages of Scripture. And we pointed to a different diagram, a diagram like a donut. And we said that this is the way God designed life to work from beginning to end. You read it in every page of this book. That God wants us to put Him at the very center of our lives as our highest priority. In the book of Genesis, you read about Adam and Eve, the first two created. And God said, you're free to do anything. But I want you to show your allegiance to me. I'm going to put a tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you'll show your allegiance to me by not eating of it. When you eat of it, you will show your disreverence for me, and you will surely die. Adam and Eve ate of the tree. We fell away from God at the center of our lives, and life has never been the same. And you read through the story of the Old Testament, God came to a man named Abraham, and he said, Abraham, I'm going I'm to do something a little different. I'm going to call a people back to myself as the highest priority of their lives, and I want to do it through you. And so Abraham started this nation, the Israelite nation, and then Abraham, and then Isaac, and then Jacob, and then Joseph, and the people strayed away from God, and they went into captivity in Egypt. And so you're walking through the story. This is our story. They went into captivity in Egypt. And God raised up Moses to lead them out, and he brought them out into the desert. And God said, now I'm going to write it down for you. I'm going to make it really clear. And so Moses went up on Mount Sinai, and on Mount Sinai he heard from God, and God put the tablets of the Ten Commandments together, and and Moses came down. And when he went down to the people, God spoke All these words he said to the people, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And here's the most important thing. You shall have nothing more important than me. This is God's work in our world, speaking to humanity. At the very center of your lives, the highest priority I want for you. I want it to be me. Later when Moses would hand off the baton to Joshua and they were, promised, they were in the promised land, Moses would say this, be very careful to keep the commandment and the law of Moses. Love the Lord your God. Listen to this. Walk in obedience to Him. Keep His commands. Hold fast to Him. Serve Him with all of your heart and all of your soul. Fast forward to Jesus. Jesus was being questioned in He was stumping the people, and so hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. At the start of this fall, I just want to ask you this simple question. I mean, it's really a one-point message. And if you don't answer this with a yes, it's totally fine. And only you know is God, the pursuit of Him, the knowledge of Him, the love of Him, an intimacy with Him, the driving force in your life. If it is, and really on the authority of God's Word, I'll just tell you, your priorities are misplaced. God has said, I want to be first. The Old Testament tells us He's a jealous God. He doesn't want to have to compete. Jesus said, I wish you were either hot or cold. But this playing around with me as if I'm another priority in the midst of others. Where is God at in your life? If He's not first, you know what happens when you put God first? God is the giver of faith. 
Think of Daniel. Put God first and he was bowing down to God and the king said that shouldn't happen. So the king threw him in the lion's den. And what happened in the lion's den? The lion's mouths were shut up by God and Daniel's faith grew. Think of David. He came on the scene with the Israelite army and and God was prompting him because he was honoring God first in his life. He's prompting, go out against this Goliath, this huge giant. And you know what happened when David went out in obedience to God? His faith grew. Unless you say, God, whatever you want first for me, above my work, above my pursuit of pleasure, above my recreation, above my family, above, above everything else, even above my family, I will put you first. How can you expect him to cause your faith to become an eight or a nine or a ten? Those who put their hands to the plow, Jesus said, and look back are not fit for service in the kingdom. That's the fives, the sixes, the lukewarm. Always questioning, always wondering. Jesus said, put your hand to the plow. Put your face like flint forward. Follow me. One of the disciples said, well, what about, what about this other disciple here? Jesus said, what is that to you? Stop worrying about him. You follow me. Matthew 6, Jesus said, seek what? Second, seek third, no. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then what? He will take care of the rest. It's simple. It's not easy to do. But it's simple. It's one thing. One thing. Put God first. C.S. Lewis writes, it's easy to understand, but it's hard to do. The real problem in the Christian life comes where people do not usually look for it. It comes the very moment you wake up each morning. All your wishes and hopes for the day rush at you like wild animals. And the first job each morning consists simply in shoving them all back and listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, letting that other larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in, and so on all day, standing back from all your natural fussings and frettings, coming out into the wind. We can only do it for moments at first, but from those moments, this new sort of life will be spreading through our system because now we're letting Him work at the right part of us. It's the difference between paint, which is merely laid on the surface, and dye, which begins, or stain, which begins to soak right through to the center of who we are, where we, as the prophet said, begin to, in him we live and move and have our very being. There's a God-shaped vacuum in the center of every one of us that only God can fill. And we will only experience that life that he offered us if we put him first. I want to close with a gentleman we probably all know. There was a foundation that was built after his life. And the foundation is, is very simply a foundation that promotes the primor- priority of God at the center of life, the highest importance. One of his former players, Aaron Campman, said his legacy for many will be associated with his tremendous success as a football coach. However, he says, I believe his greatest legacy comes not in how many football games he won or lost, but in the fact that he was a committed follower, first and foremost, of Jesus Christ. One of his sons, Aaron Thomas, says he was proud most of his involvement which puts faith at the center of his involvement in the church. Jack Palance. The Apostle Paul said, one thing I do. And Paul didn't know a lot of pleasure, but he had a passionate life. And from prison, he said, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. I press forward to the high calling of Christ. If you're starting this fall, friends, and this isn't your highest priority, I mean, you can join me in saying, God, I'm sorry. I have a tendency to dethrone you, put other things there first, and I want to repent and turn back and pursue you as the greatest priority of my life. 
I want to say a prayer. And if, if that's you this morning, maybe it's pleasure, maybe it's your work, maybe it's advancement, maybe it's relationships, money. I want to encourage you, if the Spirit is speaking to you, say, God, I'm sorry. It's really a sign that I'm playing games with you, that I'm lukewarm. Would you heat me back up? Or if you're a zero, God, would you help me take that first step and taste and see that you're good? Now let's pray together. Father, your word has been so clear down through history that you're calling people back to yourself time and time again. And as we come to you, as C.S. Lewis wrote, we can begin to hear as we develop a relationship with you through prayer, through meeting with others. We can start to hear your voice and start to walk in the, that quieter voice. We can start to hear from your spirit which will then help us order our lives in the way that, that you would direct us to order them. And our lives, though they may not make sense, will have a sense of being directed by you. And as we walk in that over time, Lord, we can begin to experience what, what your son called rivers of living water flowing within us. We can start to experience, Lord, that full life you came to give us. But only if we put you first, Lord. So help us this morning in our hearts as we return to singing. To turn our hearts towards you and, and make a resolution in our minds. God, we want you first. Before all of those other things, we want you first. And then we'd ask that you order our lives in the priorities you would have for us. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen.